Welcome to the Seraphim Machinery Podcast. We are your seating and tillage specialists aiming to deliver business updates, industry stories and special guests from customers, dealers, suppliers and Seraphim staff. John Harper from the Mate Helping Mate Podcast stops by to visit the team on his travels. He has a long list of accolades from farmer to podcast host and receiving an Order of Australia Medal advocating for mental health. John speaks to Rodney about his past experiences and overcoming his own mental health battle. He shares simple strategies to help others that are doing it tough. Now it's time to hear from these two jokers. Take it away, Rodney. Welcome everybody to the Surf Machinery Podcast. Today, I've got a very special guest, uh, somebody that I've been wanting to speak to and have a bit of a chat to for a fair while. Uh, and special guest hails from a little town called Stock and Bingle, uh, which is in the southwest slopes of New South Wales. Uh, this gentleman is a farmer, a wheat farmer. Uh, he's an ex-shearer. Uh, he's a dad, a grandfather, very proud. Uh, he's a mental health advocate. Uh, he's the recipient of an OAM more recently. Uh, what have we also got? Uh, podcast extraordinaire. That's where uh, I come across, John. And uh, generally just an all-round good Aussie bloke, somebody that's pretty laid back and... Uh, yeah, welcome, Mr. John Harbour. Thanks very much for coming in, mate. Really appreciate well, it. Well, thanks for having me. Yeah, I'd like to think I, well, I often say I'm just a farmer. Yeah. And people get a little peeved <laughs> thinking <laughs> that right. I'm talking myself down. But I think I'm like a lot of your clients is that I'm proud to be a farmer. So I only too. just have to be a farmer. That's good enough for me. Yeah. And uh, it's the same, all that other crap you put out there, buddy, <laughs> that's that's extra. But, you know, as I say, I really appreciated Seraphin backing us and doing stuff because really it's the nitty-gritty that counts that gets the job done. Yeah. I'm sitting here in your workshop and some of it's fancy, but if you look at the core, it's the basic stuff that we've got to get right. Yeah to achieve anything, whether that's farming or mental health. So I'm pleased to be working together with Seraphin to make Australian farming better. Yeah. And that's the thing with our with our podcast, it sort of it's a bit bit out there. It's a bit different because I don't think there's any other importers or manufacturers or anybody in the machinery game that's sort of reaching out to do this. And a lot of people have asked me why, why are you getting into it? Well, at the end of the day, we're just a machinery company. But when it comes to the to the grand scheme of things, we want to be involved with our customers, with people that live here and breathe the rural lifestyle. Um, we want to be a part of it to make it better as well. And listening to your podcast over the period of time, and we'll get into this a bit more, um, but it, it just really stands to, to see that it's something that you're very passionate about, we're very passionate about, and we hope that we can help raise some awareness um, on a, a range of topics. And mental health is really one that um, personally, you know, I've been affected by mental health over the time. Um, I don't think there's too many people that haven't. And uh, it's something that I think more people need to talk about. And um, I'm really excited to be able to get this chance to, to get some wisdom from you. I know that you say you... The, you're just a, a mental health advocate as such, and you're not uh, not an expert, but uh, I think what you've got is some really fantastic tips and, and some good life advices that you could probably share with us. But when you think about it, I suppose, it's interesting you say, okay, expert and all that, but what is an expert and where does the expertise get derived from. A lot of people look at education and stuff, but where did the theory, where did all of that come from? It come from just ordinary jokers That's like right. you and me, mate. <laughs> That's and, true. And companies, you know, like Seraphin. And, you know, to me, that's what's important. I think a lot of us ordinary jokers sell ourselves short, be that farmers, yep. you know, be that fellas like me that are dabbling in mental health, all of that. And I just think we need to recognise that we do have potential. 
I mean, one of the reasons I suppose I got further involved with Seraphin was that I did ask around yep. and find out what you were like. And I realised it's a family business and that. It's not all about profit and money. Sure, we need that to survive That's right. and to move forward. But really the strength in a business like this is word of mouth. And when we are trying to help people with mental health issues, I find it's exactly the same. It's word of mouth. Yeah. We often try and push people to experts because we think they're the best. But there's so many stories out there where a mate has just done or said the right thing at the right time and that's helped solve the problem and got somebody back going again. Yeah. You know, and, and that's what I think ordinary people and, and your listeners need to understand is, is that kind of caper. And I was bloody surprised that you bastards were dabbling in <laughs> podcasts and doing other things. But it's, once again, it's really interesting. There's more than one way of skinning a cat. Sorry, you pet lovers out there. But if we want good messaging, and as I said, be that mental health, be that ag equipment, whatever else, we've got to use different ways of dealing with it. I was involved probably about eight years ago with um, the Shearer's Ballet, yep. which was to do with mental health issues. And it was the Australian Ballet Company did a thing, the Shearer's Ballet, through a group over in Cowra, you know. And I mean... Well, you look at me, buddy. You can see me prancing around in a, a pair, pair of tights, tights doing pirouettes. And I'm looking at you, and I don't think you're that type either. All, all I can say, John, is that um, if anybody, probably about 12 years ago, I think it might have been. Oh, you'd have a go then, would you? Well, I did, actually. Ballet? I did. Far out. Yeah. Well, there you go. The Ardleth and Hall, and it was a uh, production of, I think, it, well, it wasn't for mental health, uh, but it was bloody good for my mental health because... Everybody there had a, had a bloody great time. Uh, it was the, the local dance school got together. They wanted their dads to get up and do uh, do a bit of dalo, ballet. Uh, so I got chose for the Swan Lake. And my, my daughter, daughter wasn't, wasn't a part of it. it. I still got roped into it. Uh, so, yeah, footy shorts, 2-2, two -two, footy socks, bluey singlet. But it was great, and it brought the whole community together. Well, and it lifted the whole community, wasn't it? And how many years ago was that? 12, 13 years ago. So that was probably in the tail end of the last drought, the yep, millennium drought. So, I mean, there's something that picked um, attitude up. People probably had a laugh and a smile. You certainly did, mate. And that's still better talking. for a day or two than being <laughs> miserable that's right. for that's bloody funny. eight years or something. It was. It was horrible. So Far out. Would you like? Uh, yeah, quite, all right. There you go. There, wow. There. I never thought you I'd actually see tell that anybody that. He just did a twist then. <laughs> Beautiful, mate. <laughs> um, can we go right back to the start? Just a bit of a story about yourself, just for people that haven't heard the John Harper story, because like I said, I've listened to your podcast, Mate Helping Mate, and, and just before any, we go any further, if you do get a chance to, have a, have a look. It's on uh, Apple, uh, Apple Music, I think it is, um, Spotify. Just Google it and you'll come across it, Mate Helping Mate. Um, it is a great, great podcast. I think you're up to 21 episodes now, maybe more. I don't count, buddy. You I'm a count. farmer. I'm not a <laughs> bloody accountant. Yeah, right. I got no idea. I just, yeah, turn them out. And, and it, but it's funny because there's so many people that you've, you've interviewed and talked to that we deal with and we have dealt with and we know personally, but you managed to... to get their story out and, and uh, share a side of, you know, different to what we see. We see the numbers, we see their needs of what they need from their machinery and what their farming does, but you take it to another level. So, Well, some people say take it to another level or some say take it down. I like we'll to think down, that we, probably, yeah. we take it down, but once again, it highlights the point. I taught other people because... I don't believe I'm a guru and the brightest bastard in the in the place, 
But I do believe, and I said right at the start, that the expertise and the knowledge obviously comes from ordinary people right at the very start. And if we can get them speaking up, who do we listen to? So if I'm going to buy <clears throat> another car, you know, and I'm a Holden fan, I'd probably buy another Holden, but then I'll put it out there and I'll listen to my mates and see, and they'll say, oh, go to this one, go to that one. And what do you tend to do? You might already, I might already have my mind made up, but for instance, I bought a vehicle and it ended up being an Isuzu because when I asked around, that was, they had a good name yeah. and in the papers, in the magazines, it was supposed to be the best towing vehicle. Brilliant job, best decision I ever made. 380,000 k's later, still pulling the van. But that's the same in regards to, as I said, whether it's machinery, farming, what what do we tend to do? It's good to have the experts float stuff into us, but then who do we tend to go with, our peers? Yeah, who will you trust? Yeah. Well, that's the value. And, uh, and once again, that highlights there's a similarity between mental health and machinery stuff, okay? You can get some flash, you know, salesman like Vince going around. <laughs> I had to get that dig on Vince, saying he dobbed me in for this podcast <laughs> yeah. shit. But anyway, you know, but do you listen to him or do you listen to your mates? Do you listen to your mates. And yeah, then the beauty is that, that if he is tied up, which most of them are, in Seraphin, it's a family business. It's 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 more about money. It's, it's well, it's the same when I'm trying to get um, knowledge or wisdom or strategies from ordinary people out. Is that that's what I'm looking for? And what we find is that there's hundreds of us out there. There's hundreds of people like me out there with wisdom and knowledge. It started off probably from that. So in the millennium drought, I hit the wall, okay? I didn't have a lot of debt. I had about 300 grand debt, which was bugger all, but I couldn't sleep. The debt and the fear of it growing just got me and dragged me down. Yep. And I just couldn't sleep. You other jokers out there would know exactly what it's like. So talking over with my family, we decided we'd sell part of the property, which for a farmer is terrible. So I will tell people that's the worst decision I ever made was to sell ground because as a farmer you want more ground. But it was the best decision I ever made in regards to my health, my family, whatever else. Uh, and it still irks me because when I go down the main, out my entrance, the block I saw was the block right at the end at the T where I turned to go onto the main road. So I look out onto that block that I got rid of. So that's some of the stuff that comes through. So anyway, I hit the wall and I ended up sitting on the veranda all day. My missus would go off to work, whatever else. And on top of the debt load, I had physical trouble. I ended up getting uh, two steel knees, replacement knees, yep. and that was arthritis and stuff. But I had health issues, and I'd wake up in the middle of the night and my knees were like toothaches, eight out of ten. My missus was snoring her head off, and I got really because you think if she loved me, she would have woke up and said, can I help you, darling? No. Nah. The little mongrel would keep snoring. I'd get to the stage where I thought she was pretending to be asleep because she wanted me to ask her, but I'm a t big, tough Australian joker. Uh, I wasn't going to ask her. I'd get up in the morning and she'd say, did you have a good night's sleep? Hey, what do you think I was thinking? Pardon the language, but I'd be thinking, no, you bitch, and you know I didn't sleep all bloody night, you bloody, yeah. No, you don't care. So I'd get up, go and have me breakfast, I'd go out to go out in the paddock and I'd go in to clean me teeth and the friggin' toothpaste was squeezed in the middle of the tube 
And I hated that. She knew that. I went and got all them fangled things where you roll up the toothpaste and pegs, all that, but nah, still get squeezed in the middle. I'd go out in the tractor and I'd drive round and round and every now and again I'd start thinking. The old brain was thinking. <laughs> Pretty good for a shearer, eh, thinking. <laughs> but anyway. That's true. And, and what I was thinking was that, and pardon the language again, that bitch, she's squeezing the toothpaste in the middle and I finally come to the reason was that she did it because she didn't love me. And how wrong was that? My wife is still with me. <laughs> it's probably the well, actually the truth is the only reason I'm still kicking is because of my wife. So there's all of these build ups and go. Uh, and the only reason I ended up getting any help was that she kept nagging me. After a while, I got all these aches and pains. So this is one of the other things that people don't realise is that they think it's all mental. It's all in your, well, it is, I suppose, in your head. But then that can come out physically. And I had aches and pains in my joints all over. And I thought, which is ironic, uh, was that I was dying of cancer. But I never told anybody. I never went to the doctor. I sat on the veranda dying. And in the end, the only reason I went to the doctors was to shut up my wife from nagging and at me. There's something wrong with you. Go to the doctor. Go to the doctor. So in the end, I went to the doctors because I thought the doctor's going to tell her I'm dying yep. and I'd stick that right up her, bugger, <laughs> you know. But he didn't. He said I had depression. And that's where I probably lost it and scared myself because he just said, uh, he knew me, he was a friend and he got me to do all these tests and everything and yeah. painted me into a corner and he sat me down because he did stress tests, all sorts of bloody stuff. But anyway, he sat me down and he said, no, nah, we've done all the tests, you're as fit as a Mallee bull, you've got depression. Well, I lost it. I got up and I said, bullshit, you are Bullshit me. This is fair dinkum shit I'm going through. This is not in my head. Because what he's telling me in my imagination, I suppose, or perception was that I needed to be in a straight jacket. It was like Jack Nicholson and one flew over the cuckoo nest. Yep. These aches and pains just can't come from. Yeah, from it was fair it. dinkum. Yep. And it's, you know, you don't want to keep doing that because you'll divert me. I did a job up in Weeper and I came across a 23-year-old Indigenous boy who had just spent three months in hospital as a quadriplegic. So the only thing he could move was his head. They sent him over to, to uh, send him down to, must have been Cairns, across to Cairns, so he's from Weeper. And after three months, they worked out that it was in his head. When I met him in Weeper, he was walking around again. And all of that had come from stress, that... In the Indigenous community at 23, he was a, if you like, it's not the proper term, like a chieftain of that mob, yeah. like his parents had died and everything else. And that stress had just, that's what it done to him. It paralysed so, him. So, yeah. So anyway, I had this stuff like cancer, boom, bullshit, near his throttle the bastard. And then I started crying. And I'm crying because I'm thinking I've got to go out and tell my mates, tell my friends, tell my wife that I'm mental. Yeah. And once again, so my stigma. view of depression was mental, was straight jackets, was all of those stuff that we see on TV. It was not realistic and it was not what is the truth. But I was running with it. Anyway, the mate sat me down and he ended up suggesting I go to a counsellor. He wanted to put me on medication, no way in the world. So I didn't take any medication. He suggested going to a counsellor and I didn't agree to that. I went home and my wife and I, and you blokes know what this is like, having a discussion with your wife, okay, about, it seemed like it was four or six hours long and we came to the decision, so this was the royal we, which meant her, <laughs> yeah. decided I'd go and see a counsellor because the doctor was a mate and he wouldn't give me advice. So once again, this is peer. This is like the doctor wasn't an expert now. Yeah. We were treating him like a 
here like a same bloke as me. He was a, a mate of mine because we were friends because his kids went to school with mine. Yeah. That we'd go and see a counsellor. So little Johnny rolls along to the counsellor and I'm packing shit. I'm thinking, yeah, okay, this fella's going to sit me down. I thought he's going to sit me on a bench and shine a light on me and and I'm keep trying to be one step ahead of him, you know. I had a good childhood. I didn't have any big issues, anything else like that. But this is all the things I'm trying to think of before as he's asked me a question. In the end, I just kind of lost it with him as well. And I stood up and I said, this is bullshit, you know. I was, at that stage, I think I was 46. I said, I'm 46 years old. I should be strong enough to hold a bull out to piss, okay. So I should be that bloody strong, you know. Nothing should stop me. He had no idea what the hell I was talking about, this expert. So I had to tell him, I had to say, look, 46, the sky should be the limit. I should be able to achieve anything I want, and yet I feel like shit. I feel like I'm dying. I can't get off my ass. I couldn't shear sheep. I couldn't do anything. You know, this is just bullshit. You know, and he just said, woo, back the bus up, back the bus up. And this is the bit that sticks with me to this day and it comes back to what we were talking about before. He said, look, I think the best thing you could do is go and talk with your, so he's using highfalutin words, peers and your neighbours. So talk with your mates, people like yourself. Tell them how you feel and what you're thinking. And being an idiot... As you can hear, because I come on this podcast, <laughs> being an idiot, that's what I decided I'd do. So I got six mates and I told them what I was doing. I bullshitted them because you've got to have a bit of fun as an Australian black. I said, oh, I was at the psych and they were all surprised that I was in italics mental. So I said, oh, yes, I was on the couch and he's shining this light on me and doing everything. <laughs> and putting the wind up and and that was a probably one of the times I did have a bit of joy, which was better than feeling like shit all the time. Yeah. Anyway, I told them that and then I told them how I felt, that I, you know, was stressed. I couldn't handle debt and I felt like shit and I couldn't get off my ass and do stuff. Well, none of the bastards said anything at that time. I didn't do the six altogether. I did them one at a time. Yeah. Okay. And nobody said anything at that instant. But after about two or three weeks, I had three of them come to me and say they were feeling similar sorts of things, different degrees. I was getting bitten harder, but they're different. I had one bloke whose father was twice as old as him, and he said, oh, my dad's outworking me. He said, I'm, his father had just transitioned the farm over to him, so he had a big dad. He said, I'm lying awake all night thinking, how the frigging hell am I going to keep the farm and whatever and felt like shit in the morning and there's dad up and he's raring to go and work and didn't have a care in the world. And another fella said uh, he'd been feeling that flat that he'd been taking all different types of. His wife had got him on all to these different extracts and he was, you know, beetroot juice and carrots and all this sort of stuff. And then he said he was on um, red clover extract. And I'd gone through our college and red clover, as most of you jokers out there might know, especially anybody with sheep and cattle, is full of oestrogen. Yep. So, of course, me being a big tough bloke, and once again, this is politically incorrect, was for me, big tough shearer was, this is me mate, he's coming out of the cupboard. <laughs> you know, but I didn't tell him that <laughs> because he would have smashed me. <laughs> but anyway, so he's taking oestrogen supplements and stuff like this to help him. And to a certain extent, they were. But anyway, what I found was that everybody, basically everybody, was feeling the same as me. There was different levels, and I think you said right at the start that nearly everybody has mental health issues, and I agree with that. Not all of them are diagnosable. And some are just pure lucky that they something comes along and picks them up and away they go again. So that was the start of it for me, was that I started to realise that there was more than me involved. 
then pure luck, I got going. And it was because, so some of this comes back to base values, okay? So for me in mental health, one was that I was a family man. I always wanted kids, even from a young age. I've got three daughters, and to be a good father, I had to do stuff with them. So I ended up, they were in Pony Club, and I'm taking horses everywhere. And once again, as I'm not a ballet dancer, I'm not a horse rider, either, I'm a motorbike rider. So I go horses, I start talking about mental health stuff, and I find that horse people who I think are, excuse me, horse people, are strange people and very different, you know, dressage riders and bloody show jumpers. But anyway, to each, to, each to, to, to each his own, yeah. But they had similar issues. So that was good. Then the local footy team, rugby union, I'd coached at Ag College when I was there, young fella. They came and asked me to coach their football team. So as a coach, I didn't want to be seen as an old fart, so I started running around exercising, which was quite good, and that picked me up as well. So it was pure ass, really, that worked. But if you can see, it wasn't the experts, my other psychologists with a bit of strategy right at the start. It was ordinary people, my children, okay, from about six to that age, 14, picked me up. Ordinary jakers from Tamora, so young, we might consider them louts, whatever else. All sorts of kids, you know, from 16 right through to 30, they were the ones that got me going again. And, and then I'm travelling along all right, and one day one of my neighbours' wives pulled me up and said she was worried about her husband. And me, being good again, didn't think much about it. And I said, oh, well, you know, what do you think I can do about it? And she said, well, it's all right for you. You're out and about again and you're, you know, doing football and all this sort of stuff. So I went home and I thought about it for a while and, and that's when I started to reflect on how I got forward and about the input of ordinary people. So then that's what I did. I thought, okay, I'll help this joker, but if I go and talk to him direct, he's not going to listen to me because nobody wants to talk about mental health. I'm going to suck this bastard in. I'm going to take him to the local pub, a bit like we used to do on a Friday night, but when things were good, we had too much grog. But what we'll do is we'll go to the pub We'll have a bit of a chat. If he lets too much out, he can say, oh, I had too much to drink, whatever else. But then I realised I couldn't take him to the local pub because he's not going to talk in front of other people. And then I thought, oh, we're still one-on-one. -on -one. So I started having to think, and remember I'd talked to some of my mates, and I realised, oh, they're probably still struggling as well. And I had a small school bus run, 12-seater. So I thought, oh, I'll get a few mates and we'll go together, but we won't go to Stock Pub, we'll go away. So we decided we'd go to Hard Lethen, where I had a friend, Hundred. But when I started to put together about half a dozen people, it turned out to be more than that. We ended up taking a 54-seater bus <laughs> That's from exactly. Stock and Bingle <laughs> to Hard Lethen. And once again, this is the power of ordinary people. So my first six mates I thought needed help, I said, oh, you know, is there some other people you think, you know, are doing it tough or are worried? And I said, oh, yeah. And I said, well, ring, I want each of you jakers to put, I think it was, so if there was six, must have been eight, six, eight to 48, yep, about eight blokes on the bus. And they said, okay, who will I ring? Give us a list. And I said, I'm not giving you a, ring, a list. You know, just ring some blokes. So they did. And initially they were getting knockbacks. They'd ring up, so I'd ring you and I'd say, you know, will you come? No, nah, I'm not going, that's bullshit. But then one of the other fellas would ring you and then you'd start worrying and saying, shit, there's something going on here. Oh, I don't want to miss out. out. I'm not going to miss out on this. And at Ardlethen, because I'd gone through our college, 
I linked up with some people there, and I don't know whether you're selling any stuff to a fellow Mick O'Hare. Yeah, I've heard of Mick, yeah. So Mick O'Hare, and I went over there, and I got a few blokes there, and we got we ended up having, I think, 96 people all up, and I put professionals on the bus. They weren't the spruik, so we had nobody spruik experts. They sat on the bus. And when you're sitting on a bus for an hour, you're going to ask, what do you do? And away it went. And that's how it all, the mate helping mate, got off. Concept that's, started, yeah. And that's what we did. And it wasn't me. I suppose I had the bright spark of putting people together, but it was people helping people. It was mates helping mates. And, and obviously many times... People didn't want to go because they thought it was all negative. And it didn't turn out that way at all because we're talking about the drought. We had blokes going on, oh, you know, that they got off their tractor to feed out hay and the tractor hit a rock and went into the dam, but it wasn't full of water, it was mud. So then they had to get their neighbours to pull it out and they're all putting shit on them. And, and, and there was all of these sorts of conversations going around and then to get them on the bus the beauty was that you know i could say to you Rod, you know i'm really worried about vince but he's not going to get on the bus okay he won't get on the bus if you know i ask him i'm going to tell vince that you're struggling and you won't get on the bus because you don't like me yeah sorry about that i bumped on the thing <laughs> So then that's what happened. And the beauty was when we got you on the bus and somebody said, what are you doing on the bus, Rod? You'd say, oh, I'm here because I'm helping Vince. <laughs> yeah, Vince is struggling. <laughs> yeah, Vince, Vince is helping me. Yeah. That's right. But they all knew exactly what was going on. Yeah. But it was that, you know, a little bit of <laughs> lying and manipulation. And, and once again, people if you talk politically correct, get upset about that. But you think about it. How do we wield and get our kids to do what's good or what's right for themselves? You know, we bribe them. We threaten them. We do all <laughs> sorts of things, ban them at home and, and stuff. Well, just because we're adults is no different, you know, and that's the kind of stuff that I like and what I find at a grassroots is that the strongest message or the more palatable strategy often comes from people you consider your peer. And once again, this is not a strategy that is just to do with mental health. This is not something that's just come out of, you know, my head. I'm that smart that I've developed this. No, the only smart I've got is that I've looked around society and community and I can see strategies that get people to do positive things and then I copy them to use them to improve mental health. So, as I said, if we talk about seraphim and and farm machinery, as I said, you can do all the advertising and magazines and all that kind of shit you like. And sure, it does get people in, but the best strategy to get people to move forward is word of mouth. So that if you've sold a bit of machinery to somebody, a disc seed or whatever else, that is Mickey Mouse looks after the soil, the conditions like that, then the strongest on-seller or the strongest movement for you is for that customer to say in passing or at the pub or right. whatever else yeah. that you ought to go to Seraphim, you know, and that bit of gear, that's the gear to go. And as I said, if you start reflecting on that, you can see that that flows down in nearly all areas of your life regardless i mean that's whether it's at school or not okay the kids might look up to a certain teacher 
but then often that teacher will be liked by a multitude of kids. And then is it what the teacher says or is it the kids' mates are saying, look, Mr. So-and-so, he's a great bloke, and then away it all goes and you've got positive messages getting out there and getting acted on. And that's what I think. And as I said, I, I appreciate Seraphin backing mental health, not just me. I mean, obviously I appreciate it because it offsets some of our costs. But I mean, if we're talking about the wider community, then I certainly appreciate that you people have got input into not just trying to improve agriculture and farming, but in mental health, and you are wise enough to see that it's, yeah, it's a big picture. And once again, some of that comes back to family and, you know, take this the right way. I've got Asian blood, Chinese in me, and I'm presuming Seraphin is Italian based. Italian, yep. yeah. So a lot of the Italian communities and some of that concept of family and the strength of those sorts of relations are the same. It's exactly the same with the Chinese like us, is looking after your elders and listening. So there's these things that are quite important concepts, not just in mental health, but in all aspects of life. And that's one of the things that you listeners need to be aware of in the people you deal with, the people you listen with or to, if they're idiots like me or not, but then also in making your family, your farming, whatever else stronger and better, then all I can say is please connect with family and with people that your mates Bouch for, I suppose. Yeah, I think one of the one of the takeaway things is that if you you got to look after your mates, it's it's the the mates aren't going to come and chase you down and say hey, like like you did, because your your wife was nagging, and I still want to know does she still pinch the the toothpaste yes, in the middle does. of the tube? <laughs> but <laughs> she wasn't this, doing. See, we often just see it one way. When I was bad, it was one way, but see, I never put my I do sometimes, never put my clothes in the washing basket. I tend to just drop them on the floor as I get out of them and go. And that pisses her off big time. And it's only when she gets really cranky and, say, withdraws any favours to me that <laughs> I decide that I'll put them in the wash basket. But then when things get good again, the bloody they go on the ground again. So, you know... It's, some of the stuff we deal with is human nature. Humans don't do anything till the shit hits the fan, generally. Yeah. You know, this, there's a multitude of things that pee me off and make me frustrated. One is that. But by the same token, you cannot be 24-7 aware of mental health and mental health of your friends. You'll just burn yourself out. Yeah. Okay. So... There's an element of there, but by the same token, because that is nature, is that humans don't do anything till the shit is the fan, it doesn't mean that we accept it blindly, because otherwise, and nearly all of you would have been or known somebody we've lost to suicide, and after the fact, it's all we're all saying, you know, we saw something or we knew something was wrong and we yeah, should have done something. Hindsight, mate, it's 2020, isn't it? Yeah, but it's... it's too bloody late, you know, and and by the same token, you can't sit and wallow in that. Life moves on. If you make a blue, we move on. I mean, once again, these are all strategies we see in farming. We get a drought, we get sat on our ass, you know, but do we just sit there and wallow in it when the seasons turn good? No. What have they had? What, the best cotton crop they've had for bloody nine years, the mongrels? Eh? Would they have got that if they sat on their ass and not did anything? Said, oh, you know, well, where's me? Yeah. And this helping yourself. So <clears throat> I've been acknowledged for lots of things, 
But as I often say to people, I am a product of my family, of my community and of my mates. So any of the characteristics or actions that I've been recognised for actually are all around me. I'm just copying other people. And in helping a mate, the reason I go for that is that in helping somebody else, you automatically help yourself. So if I do something that I can see impacts positively on somebody's life, whether that's mental health, whether that's fixing an old lady's flat tyre, whatever else, it makes me feel good. And feeling good is better than feeling like shit 24-7. And sometimes it's only the little bit. And I work on this all the time. So you, Jake, saw that I rode in this morning on the motorbike. So I left Wagga, it was two degrees. <laughs> and people think you're an effing idiot. Okay. And I ride <laughs> in the rain. And I riding. ride in the rain and everything. <laughs> But the reason I do it is that when it's sunny and it will be beautiful going back, is that I appreciate that doubly. What a great thing. And I've learned to do it. I had to think of it. But then also coming over, even while it was foggy till halfway to bloody Narendra, there was different aspects that I saw, different things that I really appreciate that you wouldn't see if you didn't get on your ass and sit in the freezing, stinking cold <laughs> and see. But they're all of that. And most of the listeners, especially if they're tied up with farming, will see the same thing, you know. We'll go through a really hard time, no rain, whatever else, and then you might get, I don't know, half an inch or something and you'll see a little bit of green and you'll be amazed how the hell is that still there, you know. How much you can change your outlook too. Yeah. And that's, they're the kind of things that I <clears throat> enjoy and I try and push and encourage in others. And I love it when I see people see that. So, I mean, I really appreciate and I'm probably even more impressed that you had a go at ballet and stuff because oh, they're the kind of yeah. stupid things I do. I've been involved in dancing in Cootamundra and, and different. even just recently I did dancing for Can Assist. Yep. Yeah. Bloody ho I thought I was pretty shit hot, but <laughs> when I looked at the thing, it was pretty hopeless. But then probably even before that, even before I had depression, I danced with the kids. And I remember in Cooter and we did uh, The Devil Gates Drive with um, Susie Quattro. Yeah. Oh, God. That must have been hopeless too, but <laughs> my kids keep saying I embarrass them. But Beauty. <laughs> That's what it's all about sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. And as I said, I'm more than pleased to sit and have a chat with you because I think mental health isn't taught or shouldn't be taught just on its own. It's it's part of all aspects of life. And as I said, I mean, yeah, whether it's Farm machinery, whether it's, and I don't really know all of the guff behind your Ag Pro yeah. part, but that's, to me, it must be a little bit more than just the machine part. It's a bit extra. But, I mean, there's all of these bits, and then to get them in so that people have the option to talk about them, make decisions, and move forward is, yeah, I think is very important. Just like this podcast, maybe you'll have to edit eighty percent of mine, Vince. But, <laughs> but there's a couple. There'll be a couple of nuggets there. People <laughs> say, "Please, please listen." Yeah. Um, what's next for the podcast? Have you got any other other plans going forward? Well, once again, I'm kind of. Uh, I'm like a bloke. I'm kind of over it, and every now and again I do. I get, I get, I suppose, burnt out, but then you get positive. So one of the things I'm really focused on is trying to connect positive people. I mean, people think you're like an ever-ready 
bloody bummy, but yeah, you get flat. And so to a certain extent, I was flat. But just before I come here, I rang a local joker. I don't know whether you're going on with him or not, Pat Tripodi. And I also go and look at other things. So I got tangled up and I mentored a bit the um, Gotcha for Life people. So I don't know whether you know any of them. They've done some stuff here in, in Griffith. They've done they some come. great works. Well, I went up and they've just starting off a workshop and I went up and did a kind of assessment and that because I get on very well with Vicky and Gus and and another girl, bass girl called Jo, um, oh, sorry Jo, up in Batlow. But anyway, they'd done a the workshop. Then I'm coming here. So once again, this is the value of people talking and stuff. I ring Patrick and say, when I leave this podcast, I'll go past here and have a chat with him or Pete the Amber. So you know Pete Sinclair does stuff with the paramedics. Patrick said he's run into this joker, a retired film thing, and he's really keen to do some stuff. And I'm thinking, shit, I know what I want. I can use some of my skits because I often do visuals. I, I'm no good at just talking. I... If I can show people or get people to do something, then I believe we all understand what's going on. And I'm thinking, shit, I can do some of this stuff that I do visuals and tie them in with Gotcha's workshop. And they were doing a thing called Conversations on the Couch. And I'm pretty sure we could do about a 15, 20-minute little segment doco film that we could do and then we could do a conversation on the couch at different places. So we'd run the little film in Griffith about the concepts about being adaptable, being uh, connected and the values of a village is not worrying alone. And then we'd show that little documentary and then we'd have somebody in Griffith or two people in Griffith on the couch and we'd go through their life and bring it back to those things. So adaptability for me is really important. So David Attenborough, and I'm not an Attenborough bloke, but this is where it's weird. You pick up stuff from all over the place. Well, he said, just little nuggets. Uh... He said, most people think to survive, you've got to be strong. He didn't say bullshit, but I'll say bullshit. That's bullshit. He said bullshit. He didn't say bullshit. <laughs> he said, that's not true. If that was true, where's the dinosaurs? And then he said, but there are a few dinosaurs still alive. Do you know what any of them are? Crocodile? Well, I was going to say crocodiles, yeah, but yeah. they reckon that uh, chooks. Well, yeah, well, chooks. No, no, stick, <laughs> stick, stick, stick with crocodile, stick okay, because he used crocodile. <laughs> yeah, good one. The crocodiles are still about because they adapted. They're a quarter of the size they were and their diet. So he said it's not the strongest that survive, it's well, they're the most adaptable. Adapt. Yeah, exactly. Humans yeah, aren't exactly. the strongest animal in the world. Because well, of their brain, their yeah, mental part, we can adapt. they're yeah, adaptable. Right. And when we, str when we struggle is when we're not adapting to changes in circumstances, you know, emotional and then the connection is once again is is still the same is that we are animals and whether we like it or not we are flock animals so united we stand divided we fall that's right you know so when you start thinking about some of these really basic shit you know why don't men talk you know because believe it or not well, for me, it goes right back to when we first crawled out of the, the mud and started walking. What was our roles? Men had to go out of the cave, out into saber-toothed tiger country and everything, kill or get food, and if you didn't get food, the family wouldn't eat. Yep. And what's the role, what's the aim of any animal? Is for their species to survive. So we had to get tucker for the human race to survive, the men. Now, would you go out into the forest with some fellas going, oh, I feel a bit iffy today, whatever <laughs> else, or a bit 
whatever, <laughs> and then you'd still go out if you felt like that because if you didn't go out and partake in the kill, then your family wouldn't get the kill. But what about the ladies? The ladies that are at home, they've got to ensure that the species survive. If they feel crook, they could say to another lady, I'm feeling crook, knowing that the other woman would look after the kids so then the species survive. And as I said, to me, it's really basic shit. And it's been you put know. in our DNA for a long time. Yeah, well, and that means it's hard to change, but we're thinking, okay, our image is, and this is where Gotcha and Gus comes in, he keeps going that we've got to change this image so that we've got this image for a man to be strong, he's got to be silent. But it's not that, remember? It's not the strong that survive, it's the adaptable. Yeah. And that's where we are struggling. So, you know, as I said, some of these base stuff is down, you know, and as I said, when you start looking at it, what about machinery? Why don't we still use a stick and a hay? Because we're adaptive. Not all of the stuff is necessarily stronger than it was or whatever else. Yeah. But it's adaptable and it's adaptable for different conditions, different climates, whatever else. And as I said, the modelling, if you think the base model, is still the same as That's dealing right. with mental health. Yeah, the concept's still the same. Yeah. It's, it's interesting you make the point about the, the strong silent. That was my dad. He didn't like to, to share. Um, with my time, with what I've experienced and what I've been through, uh, I've learnt that I've got to be adaptable. I've got to share because if I don't, then then it's not a great place to be. A um, bit of advice I was given was a problem shared is a problem halved. It's the simplest little little one line, but I, I've made sure that my kids know that. And um, and it's very true. If you go and share some of your problems, and, and, it, and it can be so simple as a sitting down having a chat, and you don't have to go into big, deep detail. Sometimes it's just that conversation. You never know where it's going to end up. And, uh, yeah, it certainly can make a difference. And whether it's a difference in your life or a difference in your mate's life, that's where it could go. Um, so, yeah, no, it's... And a lot of those old sayings, there's wisdom in nearly all of them. So one of the, the things that I would use, and if I did this little film business, this is something that I'd work into it, was that my wife was a kindergarten teacher and I think I did it out at the, at the Witten thing. And she used to do Humpty Dumpty all the time, you know, and do Humpty Dumpty and had the kids do the poem, fell off the wall, whatever else. Anyway, she did this for years and years and years. And then one year, a little girl puts her hand up and says, why didn't Humpty's friends stop him falling off the wall? <laughs> you know, this is the same mate. as mental yeah. health. Like, we got mates out there that we think are doing all right. They fall and they're shattered. They're suicide. Or if they're not, if they don't die, then they lose their farm or their family. They lose everything that's important. Yet there's an opportunity for us up there to be connected, you know, to be a family united. And all we've got to do is put our hands out and help our mates stay up on the wall. And you know, there's all of these oh, sorts of things to go around and. As I said, there's wisdom in a lot of those old sayings and that's some of the joys I get when I'm riding my motorbike is yep. something like that will hit me and I'll think, <laughs> shit. No, fantastic. Well, I really appreciate your, your time. I really would like to uh, make sure that everybody is aware of, of the good work that you do um, and, and what you're about and the message that you're trying to get out. I think it is so important to share. Um Get on the Gotcha for Life uh, website as well. Have a look because um, they're doing some fantastic work. Listen to Mate Helping Mate. That is, it is a great podcast. There are some really good chats there. There's some really funny moments. There's some absolute tearjerker moments. And um, I'm not one to, to get too emotional. Um, but, yeah, you had me bloody teared up in a couple episodes where I could so relate to the story that these people are telling. So... I think it's underestimated just how important your podcast is, mate. Um, I really appreciate your time coming in and sharing your wisdom. 
I hope that Seraphins can continue on helping you in wherever you go and whatever you need. Because, and personally, I'd love to uh, help as much as we can too. Because it is, it's it's something very close to to my heart. Um, it's probably something very close to a lot of our listeners' hearts as well. Um, like I said, everybody seems to get affected by it somewhere. It's a bit like cancer. Everybody seems to know uh, somebody, whether it's themselves, whether it's a parent, whether it's a friend, a colleague. Um, everybody gets affected by it somewhere. So. Keep up the good work, mate. Well, thank Don't work you. too hard. And I think in moving forward, what we need to understand is it's a two-way street. Yeah. When when anything of benefit to human beings is two ways. It's not just somebody giving or just somebody taking. There's got to be give and take. It's like communications. You can talk all you like, but unless the other person is listening... Your bucket. So we've got to work that out in consideration. And to the listeners, I would really would like you to consider to listen to whatever, whether it's the Mate Helping Mate podcast or the Seraphim podcast or whatever, is have a listen, make up your own mind. But if the people are, that are on there are similar to yourself, then try and ensure that you are listening to what they're saying, not listening to what you think they are saying. Yeah. And there's a difference in that. Very much so. Because yeah. there's, there's been some gems from today too, mate. <laughs> really appreciate it. All right. Excellent. Mate, thanks. Thank you. Thanks, mate. Yeah. Thanks, everybody, uh, for listening. Make sure you, again, like, share, subscribe, do all the usuals. Uh, we've got some other really good podcast uh, top topics and episodes coming up as well um, and again they're not all focused on uh, machinery <laughs> we're talking to uh, some people that uh, they've, they've been dealt some pretty rough blows in their family life and again it's all about being that adaptable person uh, and I think their story is fantastic really looking forward to sharing that um, but anyway I'll uh, leave you to it and uh, look forward to talking again soon thank you